So just a couple of weeks ago, early on July 24th, 2020, an 18-year-old woman named Gia Fuda, who was living with her parents in Seattle, Washington, wakes up in their home, goes downstairs, says good morning to her mother and to her father. She has a sip of a seltzer water, and then she heads out to her car and says, okay, I'll see you tonight, and she drives off. Gia's mother said that because of the quarantine, all of Gia's college classes had been moved online, and Gia didn't like doing all of her work in the house. She felt trapped. And so her routine consisted of getting up early and heading to Bellevue College, which is just outside of Seattle, where she could do some work in their library, do her online courses there, and then come back sometime in the evening. And so Gia's parents assumed that's what she was doing that day. But when Gia left that morning, she did not follow her typical COVID-19 routine of going to Bellevue College to do schoolwork. Instead, she hopped on the highway and she drove 60 miles to a very rural part of Washington State. It's very heavily forested. It's called Index, Washington. And she gets picked up on a camera inside of a coffee shop where she gets a cup of coffee and she buys a Bigfoot keychain and then gets back in her car and drives another 30 miles away from Seattle, away from her parents' home. It's unclear where she's going until her car runs out of gas. And when she ran out of gas, it was like she wasn't prepared for it because she was only able to turn her car and barely pull off of Highway 2. It didn't look like she had intentionally parked. And it's actually how investigators spotted it because it was jutting out into the road slightly. She gets out and instead of walking on the highway to try to get help or trying to flag down another motorist, she grabs her cell phone, her Bible and a journal and turns and starts walking directly uphill. There's like this mountain right next to the highway and it's very densely forested. And she just starts walking straight up this mountain. It's important to note that David Politis just recently came out with a video about this case on his Can-Am Missing Project channel. And he says that the area she stopped in is an area where at least a dozen other people have gone missing under baffling circumstances that have all been covered in the missing 411 phenomenon. By 11.30 that night, Gia's parents were starting to get very concerned that they hadn't heard from their daughter and that she hadn't come home yet. They started texting her and calling her, no answer, no response. By 1 a.m., they called the police. So this huge search is launched to go find Gia. Hundreds of volunteers, they have all these professional search and rescue people out there. They have helicopters overhead. And almost immediately, within a few hours of the search being launched, they find her car on Highway 2. But no sign of her anywhere. The area that she was in was actually a dead zone for cell phone service. So they couldn't get in touch with her in part because they had no service. And authorities weren't able to track her phone because there was no cell phone reception. So they didn't have much to work with, except that they generally knew where she might be, which is in this very thick section of the Cascade Mountains. And so for days and days, they're searching and turning up nothing. And unfortunately, as time ticks on, the likelihood of her being found alive is next to zero. But seven days into this huge search where nothing has been turned up, they have this huge find. A couple of the searchers that were miles away from where she had gone missing. I mean, at this point, you're seven days into the search. You have searchers combing miles and miles of territory and there's nothing, they've found nothing. And these searchers are up near the scenic creek where there's a little bit of a clearing, there's this creek, and they find in one area her jacket, her shoes, her phone, her journal, and her Bible, all in one area. It looked like she had just suddenly stripped everything she had, put it on the ground, but she was nowhere to be found. So while this find is certainly great progress towards discovering what happened, it unfortunately sent a message to her parents that at this point, you need to brace for the worst because now your daughter is not only missing and has been for a week, she doesn't have any gear. She has no clothes, she has no phone, she's just gone and has nothing. So the omen was very bad at this point. But her family and the searchers were not willing to give up. So they continued to search this new area where all of her stuff had been found for another two days. And on the ninth day from when she had gone missing, they found her and she was alive. She was sitting on a rock near this creek. When they approached her, she was very startled to see people coming near her. She clearly was not expecting to be found. She was also more or less incoherent. She believed she had only been out for maybe three days and just had gotten lost. 
but they told her she had been gone for nine days. But she was unhurt. She had a couple scratches on her. She was definitely emaciated, but she had been drinking from the stream and, and eating huckleberries. So she was, you know, taking care of herself, but she was totally confused. She didn't know why she was there. And when she was pressed a little bit further, she didn't know why she drove where she drove. She doesn't know why she walked up a very steep mountain into the Cascades. She also has no idea what happened over the first six, seven days. She only recalled the last couple and thought that's the whole time she had been out there. So it's a very confusing story and one that probably we will never get a clear answer to. This will just become another one of the thousands of very odd disappearances that occur all over North America, except at least in this case, she was found alive. Tom Mezek was the salty army veteran. He had served in the 82nd Airborne Division, which is an elite paratrooper division. He taught survival training classes, but more than anything, he loved to hunt. And he actually hunted in this one particular area in New York all the time with the same group of friends. In fact, for like 55 years, Tom and his six hunter friends would hunt this one area. On November 15th, 2015, Tom and his hunting buddies decide to go hunt in this area. And they got a bit of a late start. They didn't get out there till about noon. So they decided in order to make up for lost time to use this technique that's referred to as a deer drive, where you have stationary watchers that set up on a line about 100 meters apart from one another. And you have a group of drivers that kind of corral any deer or any animals in the area and push them so that they go past the watchers who can take a shot at those animals. And so Tom, along with three other hunters, were made watchers. And they set up along this hillside where Tom was all the way on the left flank, which meant on his left were no hunters. He did have a hunter 100 meters to his right, and then there was two other hunters all the way up the hill on the right as well, but he was on the outer flank of that line. And the three other hunters that were gonna be doing the driving were to his right as well. Behind this hill, they were gonna try to push the deer up and over this hill down to this line of watchers. After three hours and no luck, they haven't seen one deer, they start to also comment on the fact that there doesn't seem to be any wildlife at all. No squirrels, no birds, know anything. There's just silence, which is very odd for this area. And when you consider that this group has hunted this area for 55 years, they have a really good understanding of what normal looks like. And before anything happened with Tom, they were already talking about how strange that was. Also, one of the watchers who was right next to where Tom was about 100 meters away, he recalled hearing a very distinct sound like a whooshing sound or a snapping sound coming generally from where Tom was. But he didn't think much of it at the time. That is until they got back to their cars after calling off the hunt because they had been unsuccessful and everyone's there except for Tom. And they go back out, they're yelling for Tom. They're wondering, did he fall down? They're like, okay, let's radio him because everybody had radios. There's no answer from Tom. They're searching the area where he was. They start shooting their rifles into the air. They can't find him and they think, okay, well, we don't know what he's doing, but this guy is super competent. He was healthy. Let's just go to the cars and wait for him. And so they're sitting at the parking lot, which is not very far from where they were hunting. And this is an area they always parked in. And this is an area they always hunted in. So they knew that Tom knows where they're gonna be. And so they sat there waiting and waiting and he's just not showing up. So eventually the hunters call it in to the rangers that he's gone missing. A massive search is launched for Tom. I mean, they are combing this area. They got helicopters, professional search teams. They're looking in lakes. They're looking under logs. They're looking everywhere. And there's not a shred of evidence of Tom. They can't find his walkie talkie. They can't find his gun. There's no clothes. There's nothing. He's just disappeared. On the fourth day of the search, the FBI shows up and they get involved in the search, which didn't make any sense because why is the FBI getting involved four days into a search for an elderly hunter where there's no sign of foul play? Why are they getting involved? It didn't really add up. And all they would tell Tom's wife is that they believed that something was off about this case and that's why they were there, but they couldn't elaborate unless more information came in, but nothing ever shows up. Even though Tom was a bit older, he literally taught survival classes he was the guy teaching other people how to survive in the woods. He also has been hunting in that particular area for 55 years. How is it that he in no way was able to signal that something was wrong and that all these people, including the FBI, can't find any trace of him? It just seems like something is off. I gotta agree with the FBI on this one. 
In 2013, 51-year-old Dale Stelling decided to take a trip from Texas where he lived with his wife and his parents up to Colorado. He was an avid outdoorsman and he had always wanted to go hiking and camping in Colorado. So he, his wife, and his parents load up the RV and they start making their way up to Colorado. On June 9th, as they're making their way to Colorado, their RV breaks down in New Mexico. Even though they were eager to get to Colorado, Dale saw that where they had broken down was near the Mesa Verde National Park. And he thought, well, we weren't planning this, but let's just stay here for a night and go check out the park tomorrow. Then we'll get the RV fixed and we'll be on our way to Colorado. And so they all agree, they stay the night, and the next morning they head over to Mesa Verde National Park. It was a very hot day that day, and Dale's wife was overweight and not very healthy, and his parents were very elderly. So when they got to the park, they ended up just sitting at the visitor center, and no one really wanted to actually go walk around. But Dale was an avid hiker, and he didn't like the idea of just sitting around all day. And so at some point, Dale just says, hey, I'm going to go stretch my legs and walk this trail here down to the abandoned city ruins. There was the city that had been built into the cliff that lots of tourists would go check out. And so his wife and his parents, they don't bat an eye. They say, okay, we'll see you in a little bit. And Dale was off. Dale made it seem like it was gonna be a very quick trip. And so when he didn't return in two hours, his family decided to tell rangers and say, hey, you know, our, our husband, our son, he went hiking down that trail there towards the ruins and we haven't heard from him. We can't get in touch with him on the phone you know, can you guys go look for him? The Rangers actually were not concerned at all. They said that we've never had anybody go missing for more than a few hours here. It's pretty hard to get lost. You know, there's lots of tourists here, well-marked trails. Just give it a couple more hours and if he doesn't show up, then we'll go out and look for him. But after about an hour and they still hadn't seen him, his family really pressed the issue with the Rangers and they would go looking for Dale. And of course they can't find him, but they found a number of tourists that had seen him on the trail that he said he was gonna be on. They had even talked to him. He was a very energetic, charismatic guy. And they would say that he seemed like he was just another tourist enjoying his time at the park. There was nothing odd about his behavior at all. And he was walking towards the area where he had told his family he was going. While that information was certainly useful, they still couldn't find Dale. And they were really fighting against the elements on this one. You know, the temperatures were over 100 degrees Fahrenheit and had been all day, and Dale didn't have any water. So they really had a limited amount of time to find him. So within 24 hours, there's this huge search that's launched for Dale. And interestingly, in the first 24 hours of the search, a woman was at the park and was walking along the trail that Dale was on. And she remembers hearing a, a weak male voice yelling for help. And so she kind of looked over the edge. She couldn't see down below her. She was on a bit of a cliff, fearing that if she went to look, she might fall and become a victim. She went back to the rangers and said, hey, here's the area I was in. I heard someone yelling for help. You should go check it out. And the rangers said that actually we've been getting that report. We got that report yesterday. But when we went to look in that area, we can't find anything. There's no one over there. So while it seems very likely that that person calling for help was most likely Dale, we don't know for sure because they were never able to locate who was asking for help. And to this day, we have no idea where Dale is. There's been no shred of evidence to indicate where he went. He just vanished. In July of 1924, Fred Beck, along with four other gold prospectors, stumbled out of a forest right near Mount St. Helens in Washington State. And they swore to each other that they would not tell a soul what they had seen in the mountains the night before. But literally within a few hours of making that promise to each other, one of the men had spilled the beans at a bar. Very quickly, their story would garner major national media attention and even drew some international attention as well. This is their story. So the week leading up to the men arriving back in town with this crazy story, they had been prospecting for gold in an area they were very accustomed to working in. In fact, for the past six years, they had been going to this spot. So it was an area they knew well. And so this particular week that they were out there had been really successful. They had found a whole bunch of gold. It was like this great run of luck and nobody wanted to leave. Unfortunately, one of the men named Fred Beck started complaining of a really bad toothache. 
Now, they're about two miles away from this town. It's very rugged terrain. It's not safe for someone to travel alone in case something were to happen. And so Fred needed one or all of these men to come back with him. None of them wanted to leave, but they were willing to compromise. And they said, let's stay here today and then we'll leave first thing tomorrow morning. And so Fred didn't really have much of a choice. And so he agreed and they spent the rest of the day prospecting for gold. When the sun started to go down, the men decided it was time to pack it in and head to their cabin. Now, because these men had worked in this area for the past six years, they had actually built a small log cabin centrally located in this area so they could just crash out there and continue to work and not need to commute out of the town. The cabin though was not built for comfort. It was built entirely for practicality. It was barely big enough to sleep all five men. And in fact, two of them had to sleep in the same bed, like right against one another. And then the other three had to sleep on the ground. There were no windows in this cabin. It was like this awful like chamber that they were trapped inside of, but it was sturdy. It protected them from the elements and it was enough because they were out there for work, not for pleasure. So as they're walking towards their tiny little cabin, they get just outside the cabin and notice a very large footprint, like an animal print outside the cabin. The men stop, they look down. Now, these are five rugged mountain men that are accustomed to being out in the wild. They've had their fair share of run-ins with large predators, and so they quickly said, oh, that's a bear print. But upon closer inspection, as they're looking at this print, they noticed it was 19 inches long. That's way too big to be a bear print. And so they start speculating about what type of animal could make that print. As they're speculating, one of the men brings up that over the course of the week when he had been away from the group, a little ways away from the cabin, he had noticed a similar, not nearly as big, but a similar print. And when he had bent down to look at the print and inspect it to see what it was, he said he heard a whistling sound coming from the forest that was right next to him. And so he stood up and looked, but he didn't see where the whistling was coming from. And he thought to himself, I, I don't know what animal makes that sound. So he's looking out, he can't see where the whistling's coming from. And then he hears whistling behind him, the same sound, but on the opposite side of him. And he turns around and he looks and there's nothing over there as well. And he's trying to put together in his head what animal makes that sound. He knows it's not the people he's out there with because they were way over near the cabin and he could actually see them from where he was. And he starts getting this really uneasy feeling that whatever made this huge print is probably in the woods right now watching me, whistling at me. And so he abandons the print and heads back to camp but was too embarrassed to bring the story up to the group in fear that they would think he was exaggerating, so he never brought it up. When this guy tells this story to the group, Fred Beck would say, that's weird, I heard whistling coming from the forest too. I thought it was you guys. They figured they were dealing with a large predator. They decide that it's in their best interest to forego a campfire outside the cabin, which they normally would do at night, and instead just go right inside the cabin and shut the door because they don't know what animals are out here and they wanna play it safe. So they're sitting inside their windowless little dark cabin and they start feeling pretty hungry and they decide they wanna boil some water to make food, but they don't have any water. Normally, when any of these guys went out to fetch water, they would go by themselves. The spring was not very far away from their cabin. They just walk out, scoop some water up and come back. But because they were all feeling pretty uneasy and they didn't know what this big animal was that was in their general vicinity, Fred, along with one of the other men, whose name was Hank, decide to go together and to bring their rifles just in case. Fred and Hank begin walking over to the stream that was only about 100 meters away from where they were. The moon was out, so there was a little bit of light coming from that, but it was mostly dark. And they're walking over to this, this stream. Then all of a sudden, Hank stops and raises his rifle up at the side of this embankment that was totally forested all the way up the side of the valley. Fred looks where Hank is aiming, and immediately he can tell what he's looking at. Standing a couple hundred meters up this mountain is this creature that's very tall, standing on two legs. It appears to be hairy that's poking its head around a tree and it's looking at them. They could only see it because the moon was casting light directly on it, so it was totally illuminated. As soon as Fred recognizes what they're looking at, the creature ducks back behind the tree. At the same time, Hank fires three shots in its general direction, and then there's silence. And then all of a sudden, it comes barreling out from behind the tree and is running straight down the mountain towards them while whistling over its shoulder, looking like it's communicating with something behind it. Hank starts firing in its direction. It's clearly not striking this creature, but at some point the creature disappears. They don't know where it went. It's dark out. The only way they could see it before was because the moonlight happened to illuminate it. Now they don't know where it is. 
Fred and Hank abandon the water idea and they run right back to the cabin. They jump inside, shut the door, and they start barricading the door shut. The other men are like, what the heck is going on? And they start explaining what happened. They didn't know if it was a person or if it was this creature. They heard that whistling sound. All the guys are spooked. And now they're barricaded inside of this tiny cabin and it's totally dark. There's no windows. So they can't even see what's going on outside of the cabin. And so they just had to sit there and hope that this creature does not come anywhere near them. After a long period of total silence, the men start to feel like, okay, whatever that was, it's not coming back. It's late at night. Let's just try to get some sleep. And so the men all lay down and eventually doze off to sleep. Then at some point in the middle of the night, something smashes into the side of the cabin, causing them all to wake up. Hank's yelling out because a piece of wood that actually made up the cabin had come loose from whatever had hit the side of the cabin and fallen onto him. So the group gets up. There's a little bit of light coming through this now, a little crack in the wall from where this wood plank came out. They can see what's happening now. There's a little bit of light inside. They run over, they get this plank off of Hank. And as they're trying to kind of make sense of this chaotic moment, they start hearing what sounds like lots of people running around the outside of their cabin. Hank, who was closest to this little slat that had been created from one of the planks falling out, just turns his head to look out the slat. Because of the moon, there was a little bit of illumination. And when he looked out, he was horrified because he saw three creatures, these tall ape-like creatures, the same one that Fred and Hank had been shooting at up over at the valley before. They're standing 10, 15 meters away from the cabin, standing upright, looking at the cabin. They're holding these small boulders in their hands. And as Hank is looking through the slat, he's trying to get a little bit closer to get a better look one of the creatures bends down and sees that Hank is looking at him and he winds up and he throws the boulder and it smashes against this little slat. Hank basically falls over because he's trying to avoid this, this boulder being thrown at him, but the slat was small enough that it, it didn't go through. Hank's telling the rest of the men that there's three of them. There's three of them, they're right there. The men are grabbing their rifles, they're getting ready to aim out of the slat to try to take a shot at one of these creatures. But by the time they have a sight picture, there's no one out there, except they hear these footsteps and they start hearing whistles coming from the other sides of the cabin where they have no way of seeing what's going on because there's no windows and that gap in the cabin was only facing one way. And so they just sit there in silence as they hear all this whistling and footsteps and shuffling happening outside of their cabin. Then all of a sudden they hear slamming against the one door that leads into the cabin. They had barricaded the door already, so they go up and they're, they're pressing back against the barricade as whatever is outside is trying to break into the cabin, but it can't get through the barricade. When they couldn't break in the front door, there was a barrage of these boulders smashing into the cabin. Now these men had built the cabin. They knew it was sturdy, but they didn't know if it could withstand boulders hitting it. And so for hours, these rocks and boulders are smashing into the cabin. They never see them again through that slat. They kept periodically looking and there was never any creatures that were on that side. It was like the creatures knew that they could be seen on that side, but couldn't be seen elsewhere. Finally, it just stops and they sit down in the middle of the cabin. Fred was sitting in such a way that he could actually see the slat in the cabin that was now open and exposed. And as he's sitting there, Fred is horrified when he sees a hand slide into the cabin, a hairy, big ape hand that reaches in and starts fumbling around, grabs hold of an ax that was leaning up against the inside of the cabin. And as it's getting ready to pull it out, Fred runs over and twists the ax so it won't slide through the slat. And so the creature is slamming the ax, trying to get it out at the same time that Hank takes a shot and shoots right through the slat, the creature releases it and runs away. They hear all this whistling very close to their cabin, which made them realize that they had just been quietly waiting outside of their cabin. They had never left. But after Hank had taken that shot at the thing's hand, it sounded like almost a, a stampede was running away off into the forest. And at that point, the group was fairly certain that it was done. The next morning when they saw through that slat in their cabin that the sun had finally come up, the men packed only the bare necessities. They got their weapons. When they finally opened up that door, all over the ground, all around the cabin were these rocks that clearly had been thrown at the cabin. The cabin itself had obviously withstood the barrage, but there was gash marks and slashes all over it. Feeling very lucky, the men start making their way out of the valley and they make their way all the way back to town. And after the story kind of went viral, loads of people went out there to try to find these creatures, but no one ever could.
In December of 1981, Mike Woolley decided he wanted to go deer hunting in his hometown in Louisiana. It was a cold day, it was great conditions for a hunt, and Mike had a deer stand that was set up about a mile and a half down this old logging road that no one really used. He would take his truck and he would drive about halfway down that road, and then he'd get out and he would walk the remaining you know, half mile, three quarters of a mile to his deer stand, because if he drove his truck in, he would scare away all the deer. He made it to his deer stand by about 3 p.m. that day, and he'd only been there for about 30 minutes, when all of a sudden this young doe comes running across and stops right in front of his deer stand. The doe lays down, and it's clearly exhausted, and Mike would say that it looked like something was chasing it, and he assumed it was some huge buck. And so Mike's getting ready for this big buck to emerge, when out of the corner of his eye, he sees something pretty big jump out of a tree. And he kind of turns his head and looks, and it's not a buck. It looked like a gorilla. He thought, okay, a gorilla must have gotten out of the zoo. But then he's thinking to himself, there isn't a zoo around here. And there's no circus around here, so it can't be an escaped gorilla. And then he was like, okay, someone must have put on a gorilla suit to stop me from deer hunting. They're out here to try to get me to leave this spot. You know, they're anti-deer hunting. And so they're here to screw with me. And so Mike, believing that was the case, he starts yelling to them, you know, take off your mask. This isn't okay, I'm not, this isn't funny. I have a license to be here, you can't be here, you need to leave, like get out of here. And so this thing that he believes is a person wearing a gorilla suit just completely does not react. It's just standing looking at him. And it's about 15 or 20 meters away from him at this time and it's just staring at him. It's on two legs. Mike starts to feel uneasy because he's thinking to himself, if this is somebody in a gorilla suit that's trying to get me to leave, wouldn't they right now announce that and say, you need to leave? They wouldn't just stand there doing nothing. And so Mike, even though he knew it was gonna probably escalate the situation, raises up his rifle in the direction of this person to use his scope, to basically zoom in on this person and get a better look. And when he raises his rifle and he zooms in, he immediately knows that this is not a person wearing a mask. Steam was coming off of its face like it had been running. I mean, it was 30 degrees outside. And he said he could see its nostrils flaring like it was out of breath or that it, perhaps it was angry. He didn't know. Even though it wasn't a person wearing a mask, it looked very human-like because it had human teeth, flat teeth. It had, he said, human eyelashes. And just the general structure of its face appeared to be human. And he thought to himself, is this a feral human? Is that possible? Is this a, a person that has been born and raised in the, in the wild? And so as he's pointing the weapon at this creature, looking through the scope, just totally dumbfounded. Mike has no intention of shooting at this point. He really just wanted to stare at it. The creature roars and Mike describes it as like a lion's roar. This thing was suddenly really upset with Mike. And Mike believed later on that it was because he raised his weapon at this thing. As soon as it roars, Mike said that about 100 meters in the other direction, he hears this really loud piercing whistle coming through the forest. As soon as that whistle comes through the forest, the creature that was still growling stops and turns its head in the direction of this whistle and it whistles back. And so Mike, I mean, the hair on the back of his neck is standing up. He knows they're communicating probably about him. And as he's realizing this, he lowers his weapon and he's looking at the creature in front of him who's whistling and looking in the direction of this way. And then that creature snaps back and looks right at Mike. And as he's wondering what he should do next, another creature walks out of the tree line and stands right next to the first creature. And the way it walked, it was walking like a human. It was on two legs. And they're both standing about 20 meters away looking directly at Mike. Mike is terrified. And he would say that he knew that he had to make a run for it. And so he leaps from his stand and starts running towards his truck, which is about a half mile away. And he said as soon as he did, he could tell that one of them at least started sprinting after him. And he looked over his shoulder as he's running towards the logging road. And he sees that one of the creatures is running parallel to him, easily running as fast as he is. It's choosing to stay, you know, five, 10 meters away from him, but running in step with him the whole way. It's like it's forcing him to leave the forest. And so Mike is running, waiting to get attacked by this creature. He finally gets to his truck. He clambers inside and shuts the doors. And he looks out of his window and he sees the creature just standing there looking at him from the trees. He looks in his rear view and he sees that the other creature had also been running after him on the logging road. That the two of them had basically herded him to his car. It was an intelligent move. Mike believes that because he raised his weapon at that first creature, that triggered a series of events that led to them chasing him out of the woods. 
He said that he was the aggressor, not the other way around. We don't know if either of those stories are true, but certainly they are terrifying. So I'd love to get your reaction to these two stories in the comments. Are these total fabrications or is there some truth to Bigfoot? And these stories are just evidence of that. If you John Lang was a former U.S. Marine who lived in Fresno, California, and in 2015, while he was living there, he was at a local store and he noticed in the parking lot that some police were acting suspiciously. He did some digging and he noticed that they were running a scam. The police would scan license plates of parked cars in these parking lots, and if they got a hit, they would wait until that person came back, got in their car and drove away. The police would follow them and then pull them over and act like it was just a routine thing when they knew they were going to be able to bust them on this particular violation. This was totally unethical and totally illegal. So Lang began posting on his Facebook about this scam and he would tell people that this was profit driven. The Fresno PD, they operated on a quota system. So the more people they could arrest, the more money they made. Lang also began posting comments on the Fresno Bee's webpage. The Fresno Bee was a local newspaper and he would go to their comment section of different articles and he would voice this concern about the Fresno PD and he would tell them that they need to do something about this. You need to investigate the Fresno PD. No one on Facebook was taking Lang seriously and no one from the Fresno Bee was reacting to John's claims that there was the scam happening. Now it's important to note at this time that the Fresno Police Department had a very bad reputation. The chief of police of the Fresno Police Department, along with five other Fresno PD officers, had been arrested on drug charges. After the chief of police was let out on bail, another officer, not inside of that initial group that was arrested, went to the chief of police's house to confront the chief because he was furious at him. That night, this officer was found dead right near the chief's house with a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the chest. The family of the deceased officer was like, no way, he did not shoot himself in the chest. But either way, no charges were pressed, although many people in the area believed the chief killed that officer and then covered it up. Following Lang's very public critique of the Fresno Police Department on Facebook and on the Fresno Bee, Lang became very concerned that the police department was upset with him for uncovering their scam and that now they were following him all over town and harassing him. And so as a protective measure, he set up a camera on the outside of his house watching the street and he started uploading the footage to YouTube. And some of the videos that he pulled are crazy. Lang would upload 17 videos to his YouTube channel called Lang Marine. Now every video has a fairly detailed caption associated with it where John describes what you're looking at. The first video is of this white pickup truck that pulls up in front of John's property. Now Lang would say in the description that this particular truck he has seen all over when he's out in public and he believes it's an unmarked car of police officers that are following him. It slow rolls right in front of his property and then eventually drives away. And then a few moments later, it drives back around and doesn't slow down and drives right past his house. Following these two drive-bys, Lang would say that he got a series of hang-up calls that he thinks were the police calling him to intimidate him. In the next video, you see a man walking his dog and stopping right in front of John's property. John has a dog and his dog runs up to the fence and the two dogs start smelling each other. And at some point, 
the guy with the dog walks off. Lang believes that that was a plainclothes police officer that was conditioning Lang's dog to not attack him if he were to come into the property. Lang is suggesting that the Fresno police are preparing to assault his property. In the third video, Lang claims that he came back to his house and someone had tampered with his security system with that camera, and he was now missing 20 minutes of footage. The fourth video he uploads is by far the most well-known of any of the uploads, and it shows a minivan pull up right in front of his house on the other side of the street, they slide open the door and out pops this guy with some very high-tech camera equipment that Lang claims is a thermal imaging camera and that they were scanning his house to see if he was home or not. Now, whether or not this was actually plainclothes police with a thermal imager or not, if it was my house and I saw someone across the street with that piece of equipment, I'd have some questions about what are you doing here? And apparently John felt just as concerned as I would have been because at this point, he files an official complaint against the Fresno PD to their internal affairs. Lang claims that following that formal complaint, things only got worse. He believes that internal affairs gave that complaint to the rest of the police department and that further upset them and made them target him even more aggressively. In the fifth video that Lang uploads to his channel, you see a guy in civilian clothes walking up to the front of Lang's property and then stopping right in front. He kind of looks up at Lang's property and then turns around and begins walking away. And then he starts texting and he gets into a car and he leaves. Lang believes this was a plainclothes police officer who was seeing if he was home and then reporting what he saw to the rest of the police. In the sixth video, Lang claims that police cruisers were driving up and down a street at 2 a.m. to try to wake him up with their sirens on. The seventh video, without reading the description, would mean nothing to you. But when you read the description, it's pretty interesting. He says the two guys that lived next door to him had randomly invited him to come over. Now, he wasn't close with his neighbors, but he agreed to go over. At some point, once he got over there, he felt like something was off. He didn't know what it was, but he felt very uncomfortable, and so he decides to leave. At which point, he says his neighbors did not want him to leave. They were really aggressively trying to get him to stay inside of their house. And when he said, no, I, I'm leaving, he said they blocked his way. He managed to push past them, walked outside. You see them following him as he leaves their property and walks on the sidewalk to his property, he has a fence around his house and he's trying to get to his fence to open it up and they're blocking his way. They're not letting him go into his property. And then when finally he kind of pushes past them to go inside, they start yelling his name. And Lang would say that he thinks they were working with the police and they had pulled him away from his house so the police could go into Lang's house. And that when Lang was going back into his property, when they were yelling his name, that was to alert the police that he was coming back into the house. When Lang did go up to his house, he saw that the front door lock had been tampered with. And then when he went inside, his computer and his printer also appeared to have been tampered with. Now, this is only what Lang is saying. There is no proof that any of that happened, but that is the context for that video. The eighth video shows two cruisers showing up in the middle of the night and parking out front of Lang's property and at least six officers get out and are just standing there under a street light. They don't appear to be doing anything. It, it doesn't make sense why they're there, but they stand there and kind of look over at Lang's property for a decent amount of time before ultimately getting back in and leaving. Lang says they were doing that purely to intimidate him. Videos 9 through 16 are fairly unremarkable, but there is one video where very clearly someone walks right up to Lang's truck and tries to break into it. It's not subtle, and Lang believes this was a plainclothes police officer.
The 17th and final video that Lang uploads shows a carpet cleaning van pulling up right in front of his property. On the passenger side, a man gets out. He's wearing civilian clothes, just smoking a cigarette, looking up at Lang's property, and they're there for quite some time. And at some point, he gets back in the car after they don't do any carpet cleaning and they drive off. After uploading this final video, he goes onto Facebook and he shares a link to that video and he tells people to remember this van because he believed that the Fresno PD were just days away from finally launching their attack against him. Over the next couple of days, his Facebook posts become increasingly more panicked. He starts saying that he regrets ever critiquing the police department. He says that any moment they're gonna come into his house and kill him. Then finally, in one of his last posts to Facebook, he asks his friends, will someone come stay with me? I'm scared for my life. And while his friends were concerned, no one took him that seriously and so no one stayed with him. That weekend, John Lang was found dead inside of his house that had been set on fire. When the fire department showed up to try to put the fire out, the door was barricaded shut. And when the coroner did his first initial report on the body, he said that Lang had stab wounds all over his chest and his back, but had ultimately died of asphyxiation. That initial report had been given to some of the journalists that were reporting on the story, and so they tweeted about it. John Lang, multiple stab wounds to the chest, to the back, died of asphyxiation. But following Lang's autopsy done by this coroner, where two Fresno police officers were in attendance, granted, it's apparently customary to have police officers present for autopsies, but it's worth pointing out for the context of the story, that same coroner retracted his statement about the location of these stab wounds and said they were only located on his chest, not his back, and that they were self-inflicted. And so this is a clear-cut suicide and everybody can just move on. And so they did. No charges were pressed against the Fresno PD and this was ruled a suicide. When the news came out that this was considered a suicide, anybody that had been following along John Lang's claims either on his YouTube channel or on Facebook that the Fresno PD was out to get him, they were not buying that this was a suicide. They thought that the Fresno PD was responsible. A number of internet sleuths began investigating the case. That van that had pulled up in front of Lang's property in his final video when he said, remember this van? Well, the logo on the side of that van was for a carpet cleaning company. That didn't exist. Someone discovered that it was a fake company. Also, they found out that Lang had apparently tried to call his ex-wife a number of times right before neighbors had reported seeing smoke coming out of his house. There was this huge petition put together on change.org that's still active to try to reopen the coroner's investigation. But despite the strangeness surrounding John Lang's case, it has been ruled a suicide and there's no sign that they're about to reinvestigate it. So did the Fresno Police Department attack John Lang in retaliation for him discovering their license plate scam? Or did John Lang commit suicide? Let me know what you think in the comments and I'll do my best to get back to as many people as I can. If you liked this video and you haven't done this already, I would encourage you to go to your local supermarket and buy a candy apple making kit, but instead of using apples, put in a big red onion. Dip one of those in there and then give that to the like button. Also, please subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. If you have a story suggestion, you can go to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below and you can post your story suggestions there. If I intentionally use one of your story suggestions, I will certainly credit you. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram. My handle is johnballin416. I'm also very active on TikTok where my handle is Mr. Ballin. So whether I see you on Reddit, Instagram, TikTok, or here on YouTube, or or some combination of those. I'm just very appreciative of your support. And until next time, guys, that's going to do it. See ya.